It is my pleasure today to introduce Dr. Phil Jeffries from the Resilience Research Center of Dalhousie University in Canada, a member of Chris as well. So more information about Phil can be found in the conference program. So please look it up. Um, Phil presentation this morning will be very interesting and it's about measuring resilience challenges and possibilities for assessment. So how do we measure resilience? Fascinating question. Um, the presentation is pre-recorded because of time difference, because Phil um, is in, in Ireland now. Uh, however, there will be still opportunities to ask questions to Phil. I will explain how it works at the end of the session. So let's now listen to Phil. Thanks. Hi. Good morning, everyone. Um, my name is Philip Jeffries. I'm a research fellow um, and a psychologist at the Resilience Research Center in Dalhousie University in Canada. Um, I'm starting off the day uh, with a talk on measuring resilience. I'm sorry that I'm not able to be here live. Um, it's hard to make time zones work all over when you're trying to connect people all over the world. Um, but I, I, I'm not sure whether it's been mentioned, but I will be able to take questions or rather um, you can submit your questions and I will respond to them, um, not in a kind of a live manner, but I will get back to you if you have any kind of queries about anything that I'm going to talk about or perhaps anything related to the contents of this talk. So thanks for having me. Um, I'm going to talk a little bit about quantifying resilience then. That's my background. I have uh, worked in this area for a number of years now. Um, I've been involved in developing several resilience measures, resilience tools um, for which are sort of for general use or quite sort of specific use, as will uh, as you'll see as this talk goes on. So. I've got a bit of experience in this in uh, best practice and some of the kind of considerations and concerns in the area. So I hope this will be of use to people that are thinking about measuring resilience um, or who have uh, an interest in that kind of thing. So first of all, why measure resilience? Um, Actually, perhaps before that, I hope that there's been a bit of a conceptual discussion on of resilience. I specifically have omitted this from my talk because I thought it might be done to death at this stage. There's probably been um, a fair bit of discussion about what resilience might involve and what it might not involve. Um, but I'm hoping that uh, it almost goes without saying that we need to kind of be fairly precise about our definition of resilience before um, we go out and we measure resilience. Um, conceptual precision and measurement, they kind of go hand in hand. So uh, good to get organized and sorted on that front. Um, but why actually measure resilience? Okay, you might have a very specific reason for doing so in your setting or your project. Um, I'm just saying very generally, one of the reasons uh, is just to understand the level of an individual's resilience, you know, or their capacity for change or adaptation or transformation um, in the face of adversity. So just to get a sense of maybe where an individual might be standing or, you know, this can be an organization or even a community to sort of get a sense of how they might be faring perhaps at one time um, relative to another time or maybe one individual relative to another, one community relative to another. Um, just, you know, a lot of quantification is essentially uh, for the purposes of comparison. So if we're measuring resilience, we probably want to do so in reference to something, whether that's uh, individuals, the other individuals in our group, or um, uh, other maybe organizations, communities around the world, or just, as I say, from one point in time to another. You know, and that's related to um, a second kind of key reason for measuring resilience. Um, people want to measure resilience often to evaluate programs to get a sense of whether they're getting value for money. If, say, a government has inputted uh, into a community, there's been a lot of initiatives perhaps to develop the level of resilience um, in, uh, in, in a community, then, you know, being able to measure before and then after a program and seeing um, 
perhaps if changes occurred, uh, where change may have occurred and to, how, to what extent is going to be important, uh, perhaps for just seeing purely the benefit of the approach, but also maybe where further change might be needed, whether to carry on investing, that kind of thing. So getting a sense of, uh, you know, an individual or community's level of resilience and maybe to see whether something is having an impact or not is uh, some of the kind of very simple key reasons. And then you may have your own particular reasons for measuring resilience in your setting. Um, how can we measure resilience? Well, there's a whole host of ways of doing that, you know, um, basically, uh, probably as much as your sort of imagination can extend to. Uh, for example, in one study that we have going currently in Canada and South Africa, part of the assessment of resilience is uh, collecting samples of hair from uh, young people because you can measure stress from the hair cortisol that's in sort of a certain portion of the hair in about sort of a one or two centimeter length of hair you can get about three months of past readings of stress so that will form part of an index of a resilience measure that we're developing so there's all kinds of innovative ways of uh, quantifying um, things to do with resilience if uh, depending on how we're going about sort of operationalizing it um, I am really just focusing right now on um, surveys. Um, I apologize, that's not the most exciting of uh, ways of measuring resilience. It is just one of the most common and there's plenty to talk about just in terms of um, survey research and getting resilience via surveys. And it tends to be one of the most popular ways. So um, a lot of people who want to measure resilience uh, will do so via survey, which will one of these survey measures will either be something that is just used on its own or maybe part of a battery of tools. You know, maybe you've got mental health assessments and maybe there are other things going on that you're interested in measuring and maybe resilience is just a part of that. Um, so that's kind of what goes on and that's what I tend to be involved in um, a lot of the time. So plenty to talk about just in terms of survey research with a lot of the considerations that will apply to uh, other methods as well. So um, that's what I'm going to kind of focus on uh, in this talk. And um, I hope that uh, you'll come out of this with some kind of insights about what you might want to use. Um, perhaps there's a survey or two out there that kind of piques your interest. We'll see. Um, with just a note as well, a kind of a caveat that with any kind of quantification uh, in the social sciences or sort of this realm, there are kind of obvious limitations like the fact that if you sat down with an individual and you had a good long chat with them, a good in-depth interview with an individual of their communities, you're going to get a sense of uh, their resilience or characteristics to do with their resilience. That is going to be so much kind of more more richer, perhaps more accurate than a short survey will ever tell you. But clearly the reason why surveys exist is that we can deploy them en masse. We can get, um, you know, a reading from a large number of individuals relatively quickly, which can be important if we're trying to survey uh, large groups. Um, so, and yet, there's a kind of there's a crudeness to survey research and certainly there's a crudeness to measuring resilience. And yet there is a level of validity and robustness to it as well. OK, so I'm not saying it's sort of the be all and end all. Um, and it, it really depends. It can work for some people. Others much prefer to stick to qualitative approaches. And clearly some people are more comfortable with quantitative and surveys are really the thing for them. Um, what's out there? There's a load of resilience measures already out there ready to use a load of these survey tools. So this list is um, part, it's part of a list that's held by one of the research centers at Harvard. Um, the asterisks are for more widely cited measures. So the, the very highly cited ones 
are uh, the ones with those asterisks there. And if you've ever used a resilience measure, um, then you may have come across some of these in the past. The CD risk is certainly one of the uh, older and more popular ones, but also, you know, the brief resilience scale as well, um, the resilience scale for adults. Um, but th there's loads out there. You know, you only have to do a quick Google search to turn up loads of uh, validated resilience measures. OK, so there's loads out there. Um, I just want to have a quick look at one just to kind of to start the conversation around some of the, the utility around measures and also some of the kind of considerations um, that we need to think about when we are sort of thinking about using resilience measures. So the brief resilience scale, that BRS, uh, one of the widely cited measures, um, it's been around quite a long time now, going on 13, 14 years. Um, it's, uh, it's very brief and actually I just like us to do it. So if you'll humor me, we'll just do the brief resilience scale together now. Um, and it's only six items, so real simple. If you've got a pen and paper, you can just note your response for each item really quickly. Um, or if you're so inclined, you can do it mentally if you want to practice the uh, mental arithmetic. So it's scored on this Likert scale. So answers to each of the six items go from strongly disagree to strongly agree. So just give yourself a, um, a number for each item. And these items are just, you know, you're trying to think in general, you know, what am I like in general? And don't overthink it. The idea with any kind of survey research is that we just pretty much maybe the first thing that comes to mind is the answer that we're going to give and we're going to move on to the next one. OK, so in general, I tend to bounce back quickly after hard times. Would you strongly disagree with that statement or would you strongly agree or somewhere in the middle? So just give yourself a number. Number two, I have a hard time making it through stressful events. Don't overthink it, just give yourself a number. In general, it does not take me long to recover from a stressful event. It is hard for me to snap back when something bad happens. Number five, I usually come through difficult times with little trouble. Number six, I tend to take a long time to get over setbacks in my life. Okay, that's it. Okay, number for each. You should have six numbers now. And before you go adding them up, you do need to reverse scores for just three of those items, so half of them. Um, you'll have probably have noticed that for two, four, and six, these are the negatively worded ones. So you just want to flip the scores for those ones. So what I mean by that is if you gave yourself a one for any of those ones, turn it into a five. If you gave yourself a five, turn it into a one. If you gave yourself a two, that becomes four. Four becomes two. Okay, three stays the same. So you should have a number for each. Add them up and you have a score. OK, that's the score on the brief resilience measure for you. OK. Scores range from six to 30. And these are the sort of the thresholds, the categories that have been given. OK, so if your score is between six and 17, you're on the lower end. OK, whereas 18 to 25, you said to have normal resilience or 26 to 30, you've got high resilience. So these are the approximate boundaries. Um, I don't know how what you think about your own score, and if you think that, that maybe reflects you. Um, so if you if someone was to uh, come along and say, "Well, you scored this. This is your label," whether you feel that that's uh, that, that sort of accurately represents you. Okay. Um, this is probably about the point when there's some kinds of. Uh, issues that are cropping up with sort of surveys already that you're thinking, well, hang about, hang about. Some of those items, you know, the way they were phrased was a little kind of ambiguous. And I'm sure one person can be thinking one way about them and another could be thinking another. 
it's part of it is coming back to the crudeness of uh, survey and just how survey research is but we can still do a better or worse job when we're going out there and measuring resilience like you can imagine that if we gave this survey and we used it in all different settings we would get results and whether those results are actually meaningful to us or not is this is kind of like where it's up to you in your interpretation so if you had your specific study perhaps you're measuring resilience to something um, and you use this measure then would what kind of comes out of this be useful to you uh, some people think yes that's fine and it would be i love the fact that it's very brief i can slot this in my survey that i've already got a load of questions i'm going to ask people anyway and i get an indication of a person's level of resilience that's that's wonderful that does the job and that's fine other people say well let's uh you know let's let's think about what this measure is doing and whether it really is the most appropriate for me now this i just lifted this text from the abstract there's no need to read it all but just to say that the brief resilience scale this brs it assesses the ability to bounce back and recover from stress so that's really it it's it's measuring the ability to bounce back and what bouncing back actually is or involves is it's not really questioned uh and it's not really sort of relevant to this uh tool it's just getting perception of that, a really kind of subjective self-perception of being able to bounce back and in response to stress. So, you know, you can imagine that stress, again, not specifically defined here. If we use it with uh, maybe refugee children that have fled the war zone, that have experienced, you know, witnessed killing, death, um, that's something that's going to be very, uh, very different in terms of maybe what they're considering stress as you know individuals that have perhaps those very kind of protected lives you know stress is just a stressful day at work and that kind of thing so um you know there's a little bit of imprecision there which may or may not be relevant you know and it may kind of direct the scores um depending on just perhaps the population that you're using it with. So there's, there's a bit of a consideration um, about whether you want to kind of dig in a bit more specifically to, um, you know, the kind of adversity that you are working with on the context or, or perhaps not. And yet, you know, this is not to say that there are problems with using something like the brief resilience scale. I mean, like I said, it's well used loads of people use it it's been validated the researchers here they show that in their own work uh having higher scores that's related to good health and coping and good social relations and it's it's you know having higher scores means you're less likely to have uh or lower levels of anxiety lower levels of depression and negative affect okay so there's something there which is uh giving indications of robustness but it is just one very general basic measure, which leads us to really one of the first things to kind of to mention that, you know, resilience to what? That's maybe kind of key if when you're considering using a, a, a resilience uh, measure or some kind of survey research, some kind of way of quantifying resilience. Like, do you want to get kind of more specific? I know this, this conference is a little bit about everyday resilience, so, in some settings maybe that's okay maybe we are just interested in maybe resilience to stress or maybe this general adversity but you know if we wanted to measure the resilience of communities to natural disasters or perhaps the resilience of um, individuals or communities to violent extremism then you know a tool like this a, a very general tool will only get us so far um, this is actually a, uh, a quote from the International Food Policy Research Institute who have pointed out some of the considerations. So that one that I just mentioned, and a host of others. So questions of what to measure, so resilience to what um, or and what to ask, you know, who you might be asking, um, how often, when, 
and you know precisely what methods to use and at what scale these things are still being debated so i just want to kind of cap off that section by saying that um there really isn't an objective way of going out and measuring resilience there isn't a single approach which is wholly agreed and actually you know whereas this quote says these things are still being debated i would argue that when you set out these are almost things to just ask yourself. These are considerations to just go through and think, well, what might I uh, use? What are the options out there? And, uh, you know, uh, what are the potential tools? And, and when can I think about doing this? You know, these are some of the things that we might ask ourselves and try and make a, you know, a, a best guess or a best informed guess. Um, as we go and um, some of the rest of my talk will hopefully touch on some of these other topics to help guide you towards possibilities here um, because the, like I say there's nothing set in stone so you know it's key I think a real key uh, issue that stems from this is the conceptual precision as I kind of alluded to before it's about being you know, fairly confident in your definition of resilience. And I think doing so helps, uh, it gives us clues as to how best we might go about measuring resilience. So what might suit you the best? Um, there's plenty of definitions that are out there. We don't have to kind of make up our own, um, but there's plenty that you might look to and slightly alter, or you might just uh, straightforwardly adopt. And that can help point you to how to measure resilience in your context. Um, I'm going to be a little biased and use the definition from my boss, Dr. Michael Unger. Um, let me just run through this definition quickly. You may have already heard it in this conference or come across it in other forms. So in the context of exposure to significant adversity, resilience is both the capacity of individuals to navigate their way to the psychological, social, cultural and physical resources that sustain their well-being and their capacity to individually and collectively negotiate for these resources to be provided in culturally meaningful ways. OK, um, that I mean, you could put that another way that's that's comprehensively set out there or perhaps crudely, you know, uh, something which I want to just draw attention to by sort of pre seeing this by summarizing just to say that it's almost like despite significant adversity, it's access to and the use of resources that lead to, to well-being, whether that's sustained well-being or the recovery of well-being, the key being, res, you know, these resources, and this more sort of progressive definition of resilience kind of takes us away from the old sort of notions that there are some inherently resilient individuals out there, people who are maybe born resilient and that kind of thing, and it is much more about a constellation of internal and external factors that can help individuals to overcome um, particular kinds of adversity or or deal with them or, or learn to live with them okay so for me the resources are kind of key and that points to a really important way of being able to go out there and quantify resilience and measure resilience um, we can think about it slightly differently just put it in a framework you may have seen this as well already i am uh, it's always the way that when a talk comes later you're not sure about their previous content so maybe this has already been shown hopefully not anyway the way that it fits in is just that we can take an understanding of an individual's risk exposure whether they've experienced significant adversity or the extent of it and you know typically that will lead to a poor outcome unless there are these resources in place unless there are these uh, resources perhaps within an individual or external to them that can be used to lead to more resilient outcomes to lead to these more positive um, outcomes so the bit in the middle is where i am finding that there's growing kind of interest and in which gives us uh, stronger indications of an individual's resilience um i've said that it's a bit of an indirect measure i mean when we measure resilience of course it's indirect it's not something which we can directly quantify but this is a slightly more indirect approach to measuring resilience uh, if you actually go to measure these protective resources that occur at different levels 
So um, this uh, coming from uh, uh, Dr. Unger and uh, Dr. Theron's article in The Lancet, indicating that these protective resources occur at different levels or different scales. So whether they there are biological mechanisms or whether they're psychological factors, social factors, things in our environment, okay, that there's lots of these protective factors that can lead to more desirable outcomes despite adversity. You know, the presence of those and the ability to access those and, and utilize those uh, can lead to um, uh, more kind of uh, resilient outcomes. Things, for example, that I'm just going to go through them really, really quickly. Just some examples: psychological resources. So, um, do you know you might have heard of the importance of motivation or emotion regulation or perseverance or you know self-efficacy, that self-belief. That there's a, a whole host of uh, characteristics, not necessarily fixed things that can be nurtured and developed in individuals, which lead to you know everyday resilience or the ability to demonstrate resilience. So there are these kinds of resources, and indeed, you know the CD risk that I mentioned before, that kind of classic measure of resilience, is really a measure of different kinds of psychological characteristics. This is a summary of the 10 item CD risk. These are the items. So if an individual has got a good ability to adapt to change, they can handle whatever comes their way. They've got humor when it comes to problems. Like having those kind of psychological characteristics, if you score well on those, you're said to be more resilient to kind of everyday stress. You know, that would be the uh, approach of the CD risk. There's, it's heavily kind of um, psychologically focused, focusing on those psychological protective factors. Whereas obviously there are social factors as well. So this is where um, our research center is actually doing a, a fair bit of the work is looking you know, beyond just the psychological and looking at some of those uh, really critical uh, social factors like having a supportive family, like having peers, you know, the ability to trust, uh, trust your neighbours, that kind of thing. That there's um, resources that occur at cultural levels, you know, um, access to heritage and ancestry and links there, doing things with family, uh, physical resources as well, adequate housing, you know, feeling safe and secure wherever you are. These protective factors operate at loads of levels. So. As it says here, there's many resources at each level. There's loads. And actually, we did a project relatively recently where we tried to understand where some of the key factors were at all these different levels. And we were looking at all the evidence and all the research to try and find those key factors related to resilience at all these different levels. And we got a big long list, unsurprisingly. Um, and it, it doesn't make sense to go out and measure all of those clearly. And finally, you know, some are more relevant to certain contexts and adversities than others. So if you've got a particular adversity, like, you know, uh, something going on in, within a community, then there may be certain social factors that are more important to focus on than others, uh, than maybe some of these kind of uh, uh, cultural ones are important, maybe some of them are less important. but you know, we can sort of filter that list right down. I'm going to just give you a bit more of a, a, an example of that just by talking about the brave measure. OK, this again might be familiar to um, members of this conference uh, because it's sort of uh, is it, it was developed by uh, uh, Michelle and, and Michael, who you've heard from already. Uh, and, and other colleagues of mine. Um, the BRAVE is a measure of resilience to violent extremism. OK, so it's a measure. It's a measure of resilience in a certain context. You know, we're talking about a certain kind of adversity here. So uh, an example of uh, this, um, of a particular measure looking at particular factors. OK. Um, just to give you a quick overview of what this survey actually involves, this resilience measure, it comprises five domains. So there are five protective, five kinds of protective factors uh, that were identified. 
and these consist of just two to three items each. So there are two to three kind of questions uh, that you can score yourself for each of those um, protective factors. And you know, very simply, higher scores on this measure are indicative of higher resilience to violent extremism. So those five protective factors that were largely theory driven um, uh, and then were then investigated empirically with our kind of our statistical analysis that we then sort of validated that are these following five things that you should be able to see on the screen now. So um, cultural identity and connectedness. So how um, connected, how sort of uh, able to engage with um, a, a, an individual's cultural identity is an important factor among these others. You know, uh, not harboring violence related beliefs, you know, having bridging capital um, and linking capital. So link, uh, with links to other communities and also uh, links and sort of uh, relationships with authority um, and, and, and a lack of violence related behaviors as well are kind of key to this measure. So these were these um, five kinds of protective factors which um, there are items for each that make up the default 14 statements and score yourself on those uh, one to five for each of those again and you'll get an indication of uh, your level of uh, resilience to violent extremism so this this was something that was developed in a study um, involving participants in Canada and Australia and it's being used around the world now um, it's being used in uh, I, I lose track of all the different countries and the individuals that approach us that are looking to use it in their work which is fantastic and you can see that like I've just brought up the CD risk again just that uh, the kind of Davidson measure of uh, resilience, just to kind of contrast with that, you know, you've got your 10 things here about your 10 psychological um, constructs that are being measured there. But in the brave, we've got five things that are, they're far more social in nature. You know, when we're talking about something uh, like uh, resilience to violent extremism, then, um, you know, our work found that the most kind of parsimonious way of getting at that is really looking at some of these key uh, more sort of social cultural factors. Obviously, there's an element of the psychological there, but it's it's poles apart from something like the CD risk, which is very much looking at just those psychological characteristics. Um, so I've said here that indirect measures may need adapting to work best. And this is just a, uh, a note about a measure like the Brave is that it's important to adjust it to suit your context. So there are 14 statements, as I said, that comprise the Brave. That's a sort of a default, a starting point. People can use that off the shelf. But when it comes to measures that are measuring something like resilience and especially this resilience to violent extremism, something sort of so so new, sort of nuanced, something so um, potentially culturally varied that um, like we tend to take a slightly more maybe radical approach to measurement in saying it's perfectly possible if you want to take as I say, the measure off the shelf and just use it. But also, if you take maybe just the bones of a resilience measure like this, and you start to fill out the actual content yourself. So for instance, the items of that measure, something like the Brave, like we had quite kind of generic wording, but sometimes that wording needs to be changed depending on the local context. OK, so being able to, uh, you know, connect with government uh, that, you know, a statement like that perhaps is included 
because we're trying to get at trust and the ability to sort of work with authorities, but government may not be the most appropriate way of framing that in a particular context. Maybe there's a transitional government or maybe the government has kind of collapsed and we're still trying to sort of get at something to do with connections to authority, then there's another way maybe, there's, there's another item that can be developed or there's another way of phrasing it that might be more appropriate. So this is, it's sort of radical in the sense that a lot of people will look at surveys and think of them as untouchable, they have to be used as originally prescribed, whereas we would take the position that a measure is much more appropriate if it is contextualized, if it is adapted. And I will go to the, the step that says, think about those domains, those protective factors. What are the best ways of asking about those in your context? And you can develop a few of those kind of items yourself, which can be inspired by the original items, um, but may, uh, may, may be brand new. So are there other items? You know, you could include the original ones, you could include additional uh, items that get at that protective factor. Okay. Um, lastly, like another thing to just to say about that is, are there maybe additional protective factors that get at, uh, uh, that might help kind of build resilience to a kind of adversity, you know, in this case, to violent extremism in this context. So we articulated five key things. You know, I think uh, just speaking for myself, I wouldn't like to say that that is the absolute case in every situation. There may be some other protective factors that are worthy of including. We were just trying to be concise, parsimonious, something which would fit multiple kind of contexts. So something which could kind of work off the shelf, but at the same time to get a bit more kind of precision, specificity, um, there may be one or two more that can be identified. So maybe there is a sixth, there's a seventh kind of domain or, or protective factor to be added to that list. And maybe some items can be generated for that. Um, that would help, you know, we're not just kind of coming up with those off the cuff. This is if there is strong theory or, or, or good information um, that advises us that way. So, you know, this is why I say just be brave, that measures can be adapted, that I know there is a hesitancy to do with that and people worry, they say, you know, uh, that's not what was originally done. Some people say, this is my measure you can't you must use it exactly how it was used before because it's it's copyright or it's got to be used in that way we're more flexible because of the nature of uh resilience and the nature of this kind of adversity i think we would take a far more flexible approach to this so adaptations can be made you know obviously you know within reason um and, and any changes that are made, anything extra can be checked. This is why I, I talk about preliminary analyses. So, you know, there are, I'm not going to get into all the statistics and the statistical approaches, but there are ways of just looking at your data, say, before you do full on proper analyses, just to see does the new item you added, you know, you were interested in getting at that cultural identity and connectedness, that particular protective factor, you added an extra question because you thought it was maybe relevant to that. Maybe you added an extra one for each of these uh, items. Has it worked? You know, is there, is it patterning in the same way? If people are generally scoring high, are they scoring high on that item as well? Or is it going in a different kind of way? Um, so there are preliminary analyses that can be done just to check that. And if it's not working, then adjustments can be made at that level, uh, at that stage rather. So when we are measuring resilience by measuring these protective factors, these, these resources, um, when individuals might score very low in certain areas, that can help us to identify potentially where vulnerabilities may lie or where particular strengths may lie if people are scoring very high. So if, um, for example, if we are using something like the brave measure and the attitudes towards violence are very, uh, very positive, 
um, if individuals don't seem to be harboring violence related beliefs that they are articulating and that we trust those articulations, um, then that might not be a focus. If we're into community development and we're, we're potentially thinking about some initiative that can go towards something like building resilience to violent extremism, if we find that scores are good there and maybe lower elsewhere, then we potentially have uh, ideas about where to target. Um, another thing is that the measurement of resources in this sense gives us an indication of resilience capacity. OK, so with some of these measures that have been used time after time, you know, even the, the, the CD risk, these sort of well validated measures, um, if individuals score high uh, in these areas on, say, these protective factors, then we might have grounds to suspect that if an adversity were to occur, that individuals would be, they would demonstrate resilience after that. So uh, almost like a sense of preparedness. There's, um, if, an, if something were bad were to happen, that that would have an impact but that there would be some kind of recovery transformation, you know, if scores are high, whereas if scores are very low and adversity were to hit, then, um, you know, lacking these resources, the ability to access them, to use them is, is likely to be predictive of poor outcomes. So there, there is a, there's a predictive capacity to these measures when used very kind of carefully. Um, some challenges plenty of challenges. Okay, a key challenge is thinking about those resources that are most important. So um, when we talked about the brave measure, when I covered that resilience to violent extremism, those five things, the cultural identity and connectedness, the bridging, the linking capital, um, the violence related uh, beliefs and behaviors, those were things that we took from, you know, the literature base, you know, what was out there from the scientific evidence that said, what are those uh, those those protective factors that help individuals to, to to demonstrate resilience to violent extremism? And so it was driven by that. And in other situations with other kinds of adversities, maybe that's less kind of clear. Maybe it's not so uh, obvious to you. But it's the, the challenge is to go out and potentially to, to maybe to see what has been written or, or said, you know, what the theory is. So if we've got something else, you know, um, a resilience to uh, natural disasters or, uh, uh, you know, resilience to uh, uh, cyber bullying or something like that, then what are some of those protective factors that have been articulated already? You're more than likely to kind of come across those relatively kind of quickly. So identifying some of those key ones is, is kind of a challenge, but then it's also an opportunity to gather those and to, um, to, to measure them. Yeah, so we can look to the theory, look to the knowledge base, um, but we can also, depending on what's out there uh, and depending on whether we can kind of bring together an expert panel, we can interrogate that kind of context ourselves. Maybe we do suppose that there are certain protective factors uh, that we would like to include. And, you know, perhaps it can be useful to bring back that sort of the framework of the different levels, the different scales, and we can think, mm, maybe these prompts some thinking, maybe there are things in the built environment that are relevant for this particular adversity. You know, if we're talking about neighborhood violence, then are there structural kind of protective factors? Are there things about having maybe gated communities, access to gated communities or access to um, uh, secure buildings that are uh, important among some of these other uh, factors? Um, a key kind of challenge or issue, something that has to be mentioned, uh, is really about the interpretation of scores. We get these measures either off the shelf or we develop them ourselves and then we use them and then we've got data. And then the question is, well, what do the scores actually mean? Um, well, what do the scores mean it is the perennial question. Uh, a person says, I've just scored myself on your measure. 
am I resilient enough? You know, what score is good enough? And, you know, you saw before these in the box here, the, the BRS, the thresholds, they were said to relate to uh, what was maybe good enough or what, what constitutes low, normal or high. Um, it may be debatable. You may not completely agree with these depending on how you scored, but these will come from big uh, studies where they've been able to sort of um, develop thresholds in reference to certain things like mental health scores. So in this case, with the brief resilience scale, being able to see maybe individuals who are struggling with mental health and then their scores gives us an ability to kind of create those threshold points and say, well, in general, you would like your score to be this much on the measure because we know that it's uh, otherwise it's related to problems related, you know, social problems related to mental health issues. Um, so we've got considerations, questions around that and not many measures of resilience have indications for what to do with the scores because a lot of the time the norms aren't available. OK, so this idea that we will have um, an idea of scores for everyone in an area, in a context in the country, and we know what's normal for that situation and therefore what's very high and what's very low. That's that's not usually available because, I mean, first of all, we struggle to get the data in the first place to do this. A lot of very established mental health measures are only just getting some of that normative data now. So, you know, when a person says, you know, is my score normal? It depends. First of all, it, it may not be known what normal is sort of universally. And secondly, like, let's bring it back to talking about um, context being key. Like the context is going to vary in one setting compared to another. So an individual's level of resilience, like what's good enough, acceptable, what sufficient level of resources is going to mean one thing in one setting is going to mean one thing in um, one part of the world and one and, and something very different in another. It won't necessarily be better or worse or problematic or not. So, you know, cutoffs thresholds can be challenging, but a lot of the time, you know, this, this doesn't mean that these measures are kind of like and the scores are useless but it just means we need to think a little more carefully about them. And a lot of the time, what we encourage people to do is look within their own distribution of scores. So if you've taken a sample of individuals, then it's likely that most people will have an average score. I mean, that's sort of a tautology. Um, and if you look at the distribution of scores in your group, say you've given it to 50 people and you look at the say the bottom 10 percent like if they're scoring low they're maybe the ones that are demonstrating maybe lower levels of resilience and maybe we can think about why that is and, and vice versa the ones that are up at the higher end why is that the case like a little more kind of understanding of those individuals and what's going on with them um, can sometimes point to uh, the, the reason for their scores and we can also just look at how far apart scores are as well. You know, are we talking only maybe a couple of points difference? Like, what does that mean? Is that sort of clinically meaningful or is there a wide distribution of scores? These are things the, like concerns which may or may not be relative to uh, your project and will vary depending on the tool being used as well. So check before you use a tool in advance to see um, what advice is kind of being given there. Uh, and if there's no advice on scoring, you can always contact uh, the authors beforehand and see how they might advise handling that. Um, just to sum up then, I realized that I've been going on for a quite a long time already. Um, there's many measures of resilience out there, many different ways of quantifying resilience, many survey tools, uh, among other things. Um, there's plenty of repositories, lists of tools. I mentioned the Harvard one. 
uh, this Windle uh, review of measures is actually it's it's a good critical review. It's it's obviously it's you know a decade old at this stage, so there's more that have come along since. It's aging now, but there are loads already out there. There's many to choose from, so we don't always have to go out and and reinvent the wheel, even though some measures are much poorer than others and perhaps need sort of working, redeveloping or rethinking. Um, a lot of those measures, they probe that general resilience quality or just resilience in general, like the BRS, like the brief resilience scale. They just measure something like bouncing back. That might be good enough for you and your project in your setting. Sometimes it works. Sometimes it's important to be a little bit more specific, specific to an adversity and the protective factors associated with those. So something like the brave may be more appropriate if we just contrast those. On the one hand, you've got the BRS. It gives you a simple measure of being able to bounce back from stress. And on the other hand, something like the brave gives us a measure of those five protective factors and how well an individual is scoring on those as an indication of their ability to, of their level of resilience to violent extremism. There are still questions that remain about scoring and sufficiency, like what scores do I need for a certain thing or to do well? And there are answers to those. There are, it's one of the things I deal with a lot in my work at the moment, and it is, is it developing science? Like I said about mental health and it being at that stage now with some of their ways of quantifying, so do with the resilience we are, getting to the stage where with a lot of the measures, we are getting an understanding about what some of the scores uh, may mean, you know, more so than, uh, you know, previously. At the end of the day, measurement is still imprecise. It's still useful. It can still, it gives us a means to go out and survey people very kind of quickly and do it for thousands of people relatively expediently. Uh, but nothing beats sitting down with a person. So finally, what I'll leave you with then is I think I have six, six things to consider uh, or six steps um, to measure resilience that are worth kind of considering if you are thinking about going out and measuring resilience. Um, first of all, be clear about your definition of resilience. So pick a definition uh, from the ones that are already out there. Uh, adapt what's out there, you know, just be relatively clear about what you're trying to do because it may point you towards a measure which fits with that. So identify a potential measure from all those that are out there. Maybe there's one that speaks to you uh, and your setting and your definition more than others. It doesn't have to be perfect. Um, contextualize it. So if you've got domains, if they are protective factors, then maybe we need to revise some of those items that are getting at the protective factors to make it more appropriate or get away from the inappropriate ones. Um, otherwise, even if it's something like the brief resilience scale or something like that, maybe some of the wording still needs to be changed if we're translating and things like that. There still may be some, need, there's still potentially a need to contextualize there. Pilot it where possible so we can check understanding, deploy that measure en masse do some preliminary analyses. There are plenty of guides out there about how to check uh, or explore a, a measure if it's not the sort of the final thing or just before we go to finalize it. Um, and then, yeah, once we're through that stage, let's check out the data. Let's see how people are scoring. Let's see the kind of the curve of responses. Let's see how an individual in one perhaps uh, a case kind of compares to another and maybe understand the reasons for that. Okay. so. Um, there's a lot of things kind of being covered in that and I understand that it's, it's sometimes going to be jumping from place to place. There's, there's many things to cover when it comes to measuring resilience and I hope that I've touched on a few of the kind of the key ideas and it's, I've not problematized it too much for you. Please um, come forth with the questions and I will be able to answer those and get uh, responses back to you. Um, my center address is here and uh, you can contact me anytime uh, to, to discuss some of these things or, or anything related to measuring resilience. Thank you very much for your time and uh, enjoy the rest of the conference.
Hi again. Um, thanks for the really uh, interesting stimulation questions. So, you know, the first of these, um, the person who uh, asked the question said um, that they're interested in um, measuring the resilience of groups and uh, that the, the th things that were mentioned in the talk, the, the instruments, the frameworks seem more appropriate to individuals. Um, what can we do when it comes to organizations or whole communities? What do we need to consider and measure? How has this been done? Is there a relationship between an individual's resilience um, if they're members of a group and then the group's resilience as a whole entity? That's a great question. Um, I think it's a great question because we do need to think slightly differently. I mean, so often when we come to talking about um, quantifying resilience, we are tending to think about individuals, or I am anyway, like, you know, my background is sort of a psychologist and resilience has part of its history is kind of strongly linked to psychology, looking at sort of these internal traits that we are just focusing on one individual at a time, which is is not really ideal when we want to think about how individuals work together. You know, I think it makes complete sense, especially in the context of so many sort of uh, crises and traumas that individuals are sort of working through together, you know, natural disasters and things like that. Um, you know, we, there is a time and place for talking about individuals and measuring the resilience of individuals, but um, looking at uh, how individuals work together as a greater unit, organizations, communities is kind of key. Um, so it challenges us to rethink things. Like in my work, we tend to go into uh, organizations and when they ask us to say measured resilience, they're quite interested in quantifying individuals. So getting a sense of the level of resilience of, you know, um, their staff or whether that's certain kinds of staff, maybe the leadership um, compared to other staff and just getting a sense of scores and like, you know, where do people kind of sit and is there a greater proportion that are at the higher end of a scale or some in the lower and um, and that can sort of be it. That can sort of be interesting or informative enough for some people. So that's OK. And I suppose, you know, in a sort of a crude sense, if you've got a few that are kind of scoring low in resilience, then, you know, on average, if people are scoring higher, you may not have to kind of worry so much in an organization. And I suppose you'd like to think that in a sort of a cooperative environment where people are supporting each other, if that's kind of a workplace, if some, you know, may have those kind of lower scores, then they may be supported by those with higher scores if there's more of them. So that would be in an ideal world, I, I suppose. But it's, that, like I said, it's a, it's probably not the best it's a kind of a crude way of going about understanding things and i think it, it may be a, a better approach to understanding the resilience of you know any kind of unit that's greater than the individual a group uh, community um something like that is to is to sort of to go back to those fundamental questions i mentioned in the talk about you know what is this resilience to if it's resilience to you know natural disasters then we do need to look uh, at maybe looking at those protective factors that transcend the individuals you know it's good to have individuals that know where to go uh, to get help that are uh, you know willing to ask for help um, but also that there are resources in the community for for dealing with disasters, that there is some kind of preparedness, that there's kind of good leadership um, or something like that. You know, once we've identified those kind of protective factors that sort of show how communities might be able to adapt to the aftermath of, of this kind of crisis or to in some ways get the community back on its feet, then that's almost definitely going to require some kind of measurement some kind of quantification that kind of goes beyond just the individual and looking at sort of psychological or the sort of the social properties available to an individual so i you know it, it does require a different approach um i don't honestly i don't have a great deal of experience with this um but from what i've seen from when people are compiling these uh, a resilience index of a community um and this kind of thing 
is that it does seem to be that there is this sort of uh, approach where people have assessed those protective factors. They've understood what is protective against um, some of these stresses or traumas that might be experienced. And then that's where the measurement would then take place. That's Those are the things that will be quantified. Um, and obviously there'd be need to be a little bit of an understanding of what might go towards some level of sufficiency in that case, like what kind of maybe you know level of leadership or leadership style might be appropriate or necessary to guide the community through um, a certain sort of uh, problematic event um, or, or time. Um, and it would be kind of bringing those things into relief, measuring those and uh, bringing them together in a sort of a sensible fashion to understand that it is those kind of uh, the constellation of factors. So, you know, to some degree, uh, psychological capacities, uh, you know, certain kinds of things for the individuals, but then an understanding of those, you know, quantification of those kind of social resources as well. And those things would need to be matched to the adversity in, in question. So, um, yeah, sorry if that's a bit of a long winded answer, but like, you know, to summarize very briefly, I think it's great to uh, consider these things because when we are thinking about things that affect people en masse, let's take a different approach. Let's move away from maybe these uh, more uh, psychologically orientated, individual orientated um, uh, surveys and that kind of thing and start thinking about the protective factors um, and what might indicate sufficiency in terms of the protective factors. And it's about quantifying those. And then I suppose the next stage, the more advanced stage is looking at the interactivity between those components as well and like how they might sort of work together. If you've got a high level of something, but maybe a deficiency in something else, does it make up for it and that kind of thing? So it's 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 complicated, but um, you know, as, as I'm sure, many of these talks in the conference kind of concluded resilience is a pretty uh, complex topic. So I hope that helps, but um, thank, thanks for asking. So um, the, the other question that was posed to me, um, I'll just read it out just so it's here. Uh, measuring organizational resilience of incorporated community groups would be a value in assessing the community strength to endure both sharp impacts such as natural disasters or terrorist attacks, social traumas, and long-term strength, health pandemic, economic downturn, social breakdown, long disaster recovery periods, flexibility and agility, access to resources such as money, staff, power, communications, infrastructure, preparedness would be the key. This would help councils assess resilience baselines and assist in response and recovery processes. Is this type of measurement embedded in any risk areas in Victoria, Australia, and could um, it be linked to capital works grants or livability policies to improve on the resilience spectrum. It would be great to pilot such a process. Um, that's uh, quite a sort of context specific uh, set of questions or some of them. So um, I'm afraid I, I don't know uh, all that's going on in uh, Victoria or even Australia as, as a whole or parts of it. Um, so I can't speak to, um, to that, um, unfortunately. But I, I think it this sort of ties in with the the previous question that yes, it's about, you know, if we're talking about community groups, um, let's think about those kinds of key protective factors that are going to help. So first of all, you know, um, I think if we try and tackle resilience overall or just this general term, we're probably not going to do justice to whatever program or um, that we that we're trying to get involved with so you know it, is it terrorist attack or is it natural disasters like these things may have overlapping protective factors there may be different ones i think it, it really it, it kind of depends and like we need to look into um what sort of happened in maybe other settings like I th a lot of great resilience research is really based on um you know the the evidence of what has happened in the past so for individuals or communities that have experienced certain traumas maybe that, that's terrorist attacks um or you know even individuals if they've suffered some kind of um extreme trauma then 
the proportion of those who come out well the other side, who we deem to be resilient, you know, the ones with the outcomes that we admire and uh, might aspire to, you know, they, they retain good mental health, they go back to having good mental health, um, lack of PTSD or something in terms of a community, maybe, uh, you know, things are rebuilt, trust is reestablished, um, you know, neighborhoods become, they, they thrive again then uh you know what what was happening in these places compared to others that did less well and that's that sort of strengths based investigation that has guided much of resilience research and helps us to know what the protective factors are that we may want to encourage in future scenarios so you know it's it's if we want to sort of develop some kind of preparedness as you're saying is that kind of key um uh, approach to you know there's a suggestion here in the question you know should we have uh, access to resources like money staff power communications infrastructure well um, you know some of those may be more uh, kind of pivotal than others um, depending on the context depending on the adversity and knowing um, maybe how that might have worked for people in other situations in the past looking to uh, you know, historical situations where things have been experienced and people have come out the other side and done well. So, you know, um, clearly there is theory and there are ideas about what will work best. And then there's looking to this sort of the lived experience of individuals and communities to understand those kind of key strengths. And then, um, you know, having that kind of constellation of protective factors in mind and putting efforts towards bolstering those uh, in in kind of communities or you know in states or uh, broader units than that even so um, hope that helps as well thank you